would like to think that even like your like Eli Lakes and Rabbi Shmuley's might uh, might experience like a momentary hesitation about making excuses uh, for Israel if, for example, they nuked Gaza, right? That uh, that that this would be like, okay, look, you know, if if whatever else you do or don't want to call genocide, um, you know, surely this would count. But uh, we have a we have a clip for this. I heard you say on your, your debate, like, Israel could drop a, a nuclear bomb and kill two million Gazans, and it might not be legally genocide. If Israel were to literally nuke the Gaza Strip and kill two million people, I don't know if that would qualify for the crime of In genocide. In your eyes, probably not. Because, yeah, I mean, yeah, because so the have... parts of genocide are the act, which nuking the Gaza Strip is certainly qualified for, the nuclear but bomb, the other part would be the purpose. intent to eliminate a group of people. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, I think that there have been enough statements by high Israeli officials about their desire to flatten Gaza that if they had flattened Gaza, we could pretty well assume they intended to flatten Gaza. True. That is true. But um, if we're trying to so, tease out the difference, but I what mean, then is the difference between genocide and war? Well, the difference would be that if I want to flatten a city, uh, that's, you know, and all the people in it. I mean, like, try there and, were the, you know, we dropped two them. atomic bombs on Japan. There was the firebombing of Tokyo. I think you we raised about 26 different me. cities to the ground. There was the bombing wait in Dresden. Wait a second, yeah. I'm going to be the one who did, uh, hang on a minute. Sure. I'm, I'm a, you're talking to a leftist. I find the, the atomic bombs just one of the most hideous genocidal crimes in history. Sure. Right? That I think and that's I fine think. if you, well, wait, uh, you said um, genocidal. You know, like, I agree that they were, I, the, we can say, we can argue know, that they were bad or they can argue that civilians died, but genocidal? You know, remember what they said? They said there are no civilians in Japan. Um, yes, but and, is that genocide? That's why it was justified to intentionally try and obliterate a huge number of civilians. So then, um, what, so is, it, what is what so is genocide yeah, in your dropping, mind? Then, what does that mean to you? Then, I mean the obvi the term is imprecise in terms of how it applies to different. Well, situations. I think it's pretty but precise. When you but, try, when you try to uh, eliminate through violence a people, a lot of people, a lot of people, and a huge part of why you're doing that or why you don't value their lives is because they are different from you, I think those situations get closer and closer to what we would okay. classify just. I 1 billion really percent cases. agree with you. I think you actually, like, I think what you've stated is enough to be genocide. Yeah. I would say that if, because they're different you or whatever. Yeah, it, uh, so, I mean, I guess the argument here would be that if Israel accidentally nukes Gaza, that wouldn't be genocide. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I I, th I think the argument is if they if they nuked Gaza in order to accomplish I I'm I basically I don't feel like being charitable to him but to be charitable to him I think that he really does believe that if you do anything but you do it in the pursuit of another objective it can't mm. be genocide right so you could deliberately murder two million people um, but if you weren't trying to eliminate the two million people for its own sake but we're trying to do it i for well i don't know self-defense or whatever um it would not be genocidal i think that is the claim he would make it's, it seems like um a lot of people kind of have what they consider like maybe like the nazis genocide of jewish people as their like right. standard of like if it doesn't right. meet that it's not genocide. I mean, at the end of the day, genocide is a word, right? So it just depends on how you define it. But I mean, I think that like, you know, when I was looking into how scholars of that of that term and in that field define it, it, it you don't have to be of that level, right? Of like just literally eliminating every single member with like a gas chamber and have no other political goal. Not to say the Nazis had no other political goal, but we could count something like that as like the far, one of the farthest extremes we've ever seen of and that, not right? And not yeah, just scholars, sorry, but I mean, like if you look at the the yeah. definition in in international law, right, for the UN sure, sure, on, sure. On, on genocide, right, it, it doesn't require that you be trying to kill every single member of a group. Uh, if you, you know, but there is a list of of kinds of acts that you can commit that, uh, when paired with the intention, um, does count as genocidal. And so, in particular. I understand that in uh, kind of ordinary language, often, you know, sort of uh, casual news readers, uh, we make a distinction, you know, between ethnic cleansing and genocide that, you know, that that ethnic cleansing is when, you know, that like is, is sort of the lighter version 
of uh, of genocide, right? Is 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 kind of is roughly how half the calories, but uh, all the genocide. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Genocide with half the calories, uh, and um, but under international law, I mean, if you are killing uh, huge numbers of members of a group with the intention of inducing the rest of the group to relocate uh, somewhere else, th- that's absolutely genocide, right? In the in the legal sense. But also, Nathan, what's his fucking point? Because there's obviously intense. So what's the point yes, of arguing well, all of this? That's the other thing, right? Is that I, I pointed out that we have dozens and dozens and dozens of statements from very high-ranking Israelis saying things like, you know, we're going to do the second half of the Nakba now. Uh, <laughs> you know, we're going to get rid of, we're going to seize this opportunity to get rid of all these people for once. We're going to, Gaza is never going to be, you know, a functional place anymore. I, I, I posted a bunch of these on uh, uh, Twitter just uh, yesterday, you know, these, these quotes after quotes after quotes, and uh, and they're pretty explicit about it. <laughs> so what, what are we even arguing about? No, yeah, I mean, I've certainly seen Israeli politicians actually use the word Nakba, you know, Nakba 2024, Nakba in Gaza. Uh, the, I've, you know, I've seen... Um, they like plenty of cases of politicians, generals, people are high ranking the Israeli state talk about how uh, mass starvation can, you know, can, can play, you know, can like serve important war goals, talking about transfers, eventual goal, you know, Netanyahu uh, compared Hamas to Amalek, you know, who uh, Israelites are biblically commanded to wipe out not just the soldiers, but the women, the children, and the suckling babes, you know? So, I mean, there's 12 pages of this stuff in South Africa's original filing at the, at the yeah. ICJ. So it seems like whatever whatever other cl- claim you want to make, right? Like, what, like I think, lack of stated intention. Never mind intention yeah. that you can infer from actions, which is actually usually how genocide prosecutions work. But, like, uh, but the but the amount of stated genocidal incitement has actually been off the charts the last five months. Yeah, so so much so that the only responses that you see are what Destiny sometimes does, which is to take one or two of those quotes and look and go, oh, there was some context right after he said this. He said, oh, but of course we care about civilians or saying, well, you know, that's that those people don't have very. I just got an argument today with it. Someone goes, that's that guy's not really an advisor to the defense minister. (laughs) And, you know, you look it up and it's like he's he's there going, I am an advisor to the defense minister. All right. So you you, (laughs) you. So and, and we, we also get this amazing game that like was being played starting in October where yeah. every time one of these statements would come out, be like, well, look, I mean, sure, that's an elected official who's a member of the ruling party, but it's not, you know, they're not. OK, sure, that one's a member of the cabinet, but they're not a particularly important member of the cabinet. OK, that one's the defense minister, but he's still not the final. Dis- <laughs> OK, that's the prime minister. But, you know, maybe he had something else in mind when he said it and. Who knows? What, 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 yeah, re, what I always notice real quick about those kinds of rejoinders is they always rely on an interpretation that would maybe be true like 0.5% of the time, like 1% of the time. They're like, you know, there's this one little way in which that could potentially be, you know, not true. But then it, it's it's like hundreds of those. Do you know what yeah. I mean? So the odds of right. like, it just starts to get so unrealistic. It's, it's like finding these like ridiculous... And and I'll also say that something that, like, just before we watch a little bit more of the debate, just a bigger picture thing that really bothered me uh, while I was watching this is that, you know, normally my frustration with Stephen is that um, I'll often see him get stuck on points that don't really seem to to merit getting stuck on, right? You know, that, like, that sort of, like, I'll, I'll see him do debates where he thinks he's kind of got somebody on something and he'll and he'll be like super focused on a point that like often risks you know losing the forest for the trees and that's like bad in its own way right that's 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 a sort of more general sense over the years uh that you know it's oftentimes not really the most important thing in dispute but what bothered me here was a little bit different although it's related which is that he tended to like sort of you know, he would, when it was his turn to talk, he would sort of say four or five things at once. And some of them were like really big and some of them encoded just these giant assumptions that you'd really want to question. But then there'd be like one little, like, you know, there'd be one like very narrow point in there that if, if you weren't answering immediately, it's like, Hey, hey, hey Nathan, I want a yes or no response on, yeah. on this. Stop being like, evasive. 
<laughs> you know, I mean, sometimes, like, sometimes if you say some, one, sometimes reality is ambiguous, and two, like, sometimes if you say something that encodes all kinds of assumptions that one might wish to question, right? Like, this is, if you're just giving a immediate yes or no response, response yeah you know it's that's not really productive in terms of finding the truth wait uh I, there was one more thing i just wanted to say on uh on genocide that i think is a, a very common mistake that people have which is um assuming that genocide is just killing all of the people the actual individuals and ignoring the part of it that is trying to destroy a people that is a society a culture and one of the points that's been made about gaza is that because uh mosques uh because ever centered schools centers of public life theaters uh, you know everything because it's all lying in ruins the the people there are people who are alive but you are destroying their cities their culture their their history their memory um, their ability to function as a society. And if people end up being dispersed, they might end up, you know, across to many other countries. There might be individual surviving people, there might be plenty of them, but you will have destroyed a society, a people. Right. Yeah, no, this is, this is definitely, you know, right. And again, in terms of certainly the legal definition of genocide, uh, that, that is also something that's emphasized in the UN convention as, um, as a form of genocide, but, um, you know, and, and, and it's, it's just, again, it just seems overwhelmingly clear that you, you know, that, I mean, the, the example that's like stuck with me the most for the last few months, maybe just cause I've spent so much of my life at universities is that the, um, you know, a couple months ago, the, uh, the last remaining university in Gaza, you know, they used to have a few, was blown up by the Israeli military, not even through aerial bombardment, but by a controlled demolition, which is the kind of thing that just over, you know, just very clearly screams to me that the goal is not, oh, we're going to get rid of the Hamas guys and then Palestinian life will resume as before in Gaza, right? It, it screams, right. we do not want it to be possible for Palestinian life to resume, you know, as what passes for normal. Uh, in, uh, in 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 Gaza, right? That the, which is extremely consistent. If you know, it's extremely yeah. easy to understand if you think the goal is to uh, create conditions which will get you know large numbers of people to accept you know quote unquote voluntary resettlement. It's extremely hard to understand if you think the goal is to have these two million people continue to live there, you know, going forward. Right. And, and understood properly, the destruction of the university is part of the genocide, right? And, and, and this is why it's just such a problem to only think of genocide as herding people into gas chambers and, and systematically executing them. Yeah. But All right. They, the, uh, no, let's, 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 I have yeah. questions, but let's get into the debate, actually. Yeah. How, yeah, how just, yeah. It's just like, what do they even fucking say? They say there's tunnels under the... the uh the universities or something like there that. There have I mean, been what? militants in it. Yeah. Supposedly. Which, which is like, okay. I mean, maybe, but well, like, they don't even provide evidence generally for these things. Exactly. Yeah. But even That's if it were say. true, it's like you, you need to like, like if you're blowing up the university, well, when it doesn't have any militants in it, I mean that you, you're not, killing them you're just making it impossible to have a university there um uh, that's uh and and presumably the thing about people is that people who are once in one building can get in the future be in other buildings right it's just like, too much so but i mean it's a controlled demolition right so i assume that it wasn't like just full of people at the time that happened yeah, yeah. yeah like hanging right. around hanging around there waiting to I mean, yeah. I mean I'll, i'm sure if you take any major university in the world there there are many examples of you know horrible you know, uh, Harvard. Uh, you know, think about all the uh, think about think about all the monsters who have at one time or another. <laughs> well, you know, also Harvard. Uh, yes, although I'd say there's an argument for for blowing up Harvard. Not <laughs> yeah. a very good. You're really to entertain it as a as a possible yeah. course of action. Like yeah. that. This was an atrocity. Blowing up it, Harvard. It's, eh. it's it's a threat un, un, until they nationalize right and become part of the state system of uh, of, of yeah, Massachusetts, yeah. like Ben likes to argue. But anyway, yeah, we this, have, this uh, is my article in Jack, but a few years ago, where I <laughs> with, with uh, 
uh, Yale was considering changing their name, and uh, and my suggestion was that they change it to uh, UConn New Haven uh, after <laughs> uh, after being incorporated into that system. Uh, so yes, Carver could be UMass Cambridge, etc. But um, all right, so yeah, let's let's maybe uh, so we're we're gonna do. Um, uh, we're going to watch like a few different points in it. Um, we are, we're not uh, for all sorts of reasons. We're God, not I, don't, I, I can't right believe now. I have to listen to this thing again. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, let's, uh, but yeah, let's, let's maybe start around oh, 11 minutes in. This is painful. He needs to hold and combine it with the West Bank. The West Bank tends to do better than the Gaza Strip, but the Gaza Strip no. is not, as is often described, a concentration camp, an open air prison, uh, being starved. Wait a second, wait a second. Yeah. Oh, well, this is a, this is an interesting point. I'd like to dwell on this because uh, sure. I did see that, um, you know, on the on this question, this open air prison. I mean, the term concentration camp obviously is not uh, one that I, I try not to use. I mean, I, you know, internment camp maybe is uh, more accurate. The term concentration camp does conjure up images of the Nazi death camps in particular. Um, but one of the things I noticed in the in the argument that, I, that I've heard you make a couple of times is, uh, you know, people say Gaza is this open air prison. However, and you cite the Coleman Hughes uh, blog where he says, look at the development indexes. It's not uh, it's similar to other countries in the in the developing world. Um, and I was interested in that because I just didn't think it was relevant um, to the question of whether or not it's an open air prison. I mean, I've visited prisons that uh, my life expectancy might be the same on the inside as on the outside. Uh, the amount of food people get might be the same on the inside as on the outside, but it doesn't affect whether or not it is or is not a prison. That's about conditions of confinement, right? That's about whether people can leave. <laughs> uh, that's about whether people stay or go. Um, not really anything to do, you know, if you said of the Japanese who were being interned in the United States, uh, you know, well, look at their life expectancy. It's the same as, uh, same as Mexico, um, I think people would find that a very weird argument that they weren't, in fact, in an open-air prison. I mean, it just seems to me to be entirely separate <clears> questions, <throat> one having to do with, uh, you know, degree of a freedom, degree of control, and uh, uh, and the other having to do with the effects, the level, the number of effects, and there are, you know, particular kinds of effects. Obviously, people in Gaza weren't starving to death before. Now they are starving to death or on the on the brink we, you know we're seeing warnings from every single human rights organization and that the deaths have begun um yeah i don't i i, I mean i don't think it proves that they're not an open air prison i mean so the issue that I have when I do conversations relating to especially Israel-Palestine, but it really it applies to everything, including domestic issues in the United States, is that when people favor more extreme descriptions of what's actually happening, then what's actually no. happening, what happens is, is the entire debate, rather than trying to figure out how to alleviate situations on the ground, the entire debate no. switches over into arguing about the more extreme uses of whatever, no. whatever euphemistic language is being employed to... You must try Miro. Before <laughs> Miro work got lost across different tools. Monday, Jira, Slack, try Make it. Okay, let's. Is, is that a natural stopping point, or is there? No, no, no. Okay. I, 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 there, there is actually a very specific thing. Or something, okay. if you will. Sure. Uh, so when we say, for instance, that Gaza is an open air prison, that is not meant to imply that it's just because movement out of the country is restricted. Okay. Because the open right. air prison immediately right. after will follow what employee. you just said about yeah about. It. Uh, so, so this is one of the things I was, I was watching this. Uh, so I was in, um, I was in Michigan last week. I did like a guest lecture and in, in Matt McManus's class and, you know, did a thing for Detroit DSA and whatever. So I, I had a last night I was on the plane and I was watching this debate to, um, to get ready for, uh, for this conversation. And there are, um, and and this is this is one of the first lines that really bothered me for a couple of reasons, um, and and I think that a good entry point into all of them is, and I know this is going to sound very nitpicky, but I think this is actually a really important point that he said, oh, so all you mean when it's a prison or that people aren't allowed to leave the country, and I don't think it's a particularly nitpicky or pedantic point that Gaza is not a country. Like this is this is actually a really important distinction that you know, and, and this is something that I think a lot of Israeli apologist rhetoric 
uh, talks about Gaza as if it were a country. Yeah. Uh, uh, that, like, <laughs> yeah. By the way, if you want to make a, a defender of Israel uncomfortable, ask them what country Gaza's in, right? right. Because, <laughs> yeah. Because uh, they don't want to say that there's a state of Palestine, but they also don't want to concede that there's an occupation. So they, they I, I think I had this with Destiny actually at one point in the debate too. Almost, um, you know what? Yeah. What country do you yeah. think the West Bank is in? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, which is also really significant because uh, we might not even watch it. You know, I, I know we've got a limited amount of time tonight, but uh, there's a. Uh, there's a point in the debate where uh, where Destiny says, "Oh well, but in um, you know, because because he uses the presence of large numbers of Israeli settlers in the West Bank, um, like he manages to jujitsu this into a pro-Israel talking point, uh, which is you know something, right? That they have uh, that." You know, he says, well, of course, any peace deal that was made now that it would have to have, uh, you know, Palestinian, you know, it would have to be, you know, it couldn't be a retreat all the way to Israel's internationally recognized pre-1967 borders. There would need to be these big Palestinian uh, territorial concessions and a two-state deal, because after all, it would be so unreasonable to uh, to pull out all these settlers. And... Um, and and I think you said something along the lines of, well, you know, they could stay if they were willing to become citizens of the new state. And uh, and he said, oh, but you know, right now in the Palestinian Authority controlled areas, uh, you know, Jewish people aren't allowed to live there, which which really struck me as 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 a kind of astonishingly disingenuous way of, way of saying that, right? As if the issue were that just like, you know. Jewish people from other countries just wanted to like live in Palestinian towns on equal terms with other people who lived there and, and just be a part of Palestinian society. And there was something that, you know, and, and, and that, that was the issue rather than the establishment of these militarized beachheads in which the citizens of the occupying power were tra were illegally transferred to the, the territory that's that that's being occupied. I mean, glossing that is oh wow, wow, pretty anti-Semitic. You you don't want to, you don't want Jewish people living in the neighborhood. Like it, it just you know that that seemed really unserious to me. I'd agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think we probably share an interpretation of the quality of a lot of the points that he made. Um, but, you know, Destiny is not a strong debater because uh, his arguments make a lot of sense. He's a strong debater because he's incredibly aggressive and talks very quickly and is very, very confident and says a lot of things. And and because he's good at spotting, you know, any kind of weakness, anything he can exploit and aggressively going after it. Uh, but if you actually look, you know, and, and think, you know, what is he saying? What is he really arguing here? You, you, you know, you start to break it down. You get things like, uh, well, he's arguing that it's not apartheid because they base it on citizenship rather than on race, but then they base the citizenship on race and somehow that's a loophole. That was a big argument that we had. I mean, it just didn't make any sense. Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, and um, I think that... You know, when says, oh, so all you mean when you say that Gaza is like a pre you know, open air prison is that people aren't allowed to leave the country. Well, look, the, the country right now would be Israel. You know, in the future, there might be a two state deal under which yeah. uh, under under which Palestine, you know, there's like a state of Palestine. Right. That's that that's its own country. But either way, Gaza would not be a country. They're not right? allowed that, to enter the country. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> so so it's um so you know what gaza is is this 25 miles by six or seven miles strip of land uh one of the most densely populated ones in the planet where people aren't allowed to leave there to travel to other parts of the country right they they're not allowed to travel certainly from there to other parts of the only country that currently exists there which is israel right that is something that like I think people just need to constantly be reminded of because so many people seem to have trouble remembering it that there has in fact been exactly one state from the river to the sea uh, since uh, since 1967 
Uh, it's just not a state with equal rights, which is why people, you know, make the point about apartheid. Uh, but um, but in even in a two state deal, right? Well, then Gaza and the West Bank would be part of the same country. And then if you were lived in Gaza, you'd be able to travel back and forth freely as you like yeah. between Gaza and the West Bank, right? The way that you- it, it sounds a little different when instead of saying, oh, the, you all you mean is that they can't leave the country. That's why it's a prison. It sounds a little different if you say it the way it actually is, which is, oh, all you mean is that they can't leave this little strip of land and that makes it a prison? You go, yeah, being confined to a little strip of land does indeed make it a prison, which is why people call it a prison. Yeah, maybe it's like the prison in the movie Escape from New York, right? Where the entire city of New York is turned into a prison and the island of Manhattan is a prison. But that doesn't mean it's not a prison. You can't leave this little strip of land. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. Right. Yeah. They In the escape from New York uh, scenario, uh, New York was a prison, right? It was a open air prison. But like there's a very clear, uncontroversial sense in which it was a prison that, you know, again, you, you weren't allowed to leave. Uh, if you couldn't leave New York City, then yes, that would be a prison. Uh, in particular, if... New York City was full of people who had once lived in other parts of the United States, had been driven from those other parts of the United States, and weren't allowed to go back. Uh, They were confined to just this one area, right? These five boroughs. That was the that was the domain in which they were allowed, right? Then, uh, then absolutely, that would be a prison. Because uh, let's be honest, if you want a more precise term, okay, what what would be another description? Okay, for a really big. A confined area, like an entire neighborhood where you put one group of people. Well, the term that we probably have would be ghetto. They confine to a ghetto. And that term is also pretty accurate. We don't use that term because of its, you know, connotations with the the Holocaust. But, uh, uh, you know, any term you use to try and describe confining a particular people to, and it doesn't matter whether it's, you know, one mile, five miles, if they're if they're confined and besieged and there's a big fence around it, um, none of the terms you could find for that are good. <laughs> yeah, and a big, a big fence that in this case in particular, um, that, you know, the Great March of Return in, in 2018, large numbers of unarmed people were shot to death for uh, not even like, you know, ripping down or climbing, but, but getting too close to the fence with the, the intention of, you know, doing one of those things. Um, you know, so that, that does seem very, very prison like, and again, it's not, a, it's not a, it's not a small point, right? Like this is something that, uh, so you interviewed me a little while ago for the, uh, the current affairs podcast, um, about some of the same subjects and, and a point that I've made in there, which I've, I've been trying to make more often is that uh, I'm really disturbed by the way that people throw around the phrase, the Palestinians uh, in this conversation. Oh, the Palestinians did this or the Palestinians rejected that the Palestinians, you know, never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity uh, that all of these things um, are uh, you know, what, what you're doing, right. You know, is, you know, you're not even doing what you do if you say, oh, the Israelis did this or that, or the Americans did this or that, which is you're using those phrases as kind of a shorthand way of saying Israel, the nation state, or the United States, the nation state did this or that. You're you're referring to an entire ethnic group as if it's a hive mind. Um, and what I suggested is that this is, you know, that this use of the Palestinians, you know, we should sort of it should set off all the same alarms that I think are set off in reasonable people's minds when they hear the phrase, the Jews, right? You know, that's like, oh, the Jews did this or that or the other thing. It's like, really? Did, you know, did the Jews, you know, all have a big vote, you know, to uh, to, to do that thing? You know, that's, uh, you know, um, and, and and there is there is a lot of that in this debate, right? A lot of claims about, you know, the Palestinians that's like... Um, Okay, does does the Palestinians mean the PLO? Does it mean Hamas? You know, does it mean uh, does it mean every single one of the you know several million Palestinians who live in Israel, uh, Palestine, and the several million you know who uh, who live abroad? 
Um, so, uh, so that's something that, that I think is just worth tracking as, uh, as we watch, um, a little bit, uh, a little bit more of this, but I, I do want to, uh, just cause I, I'm trying to highlight the things that are the most important moments here. Uh, I don't know, Jake, do we lose Jake for a moment? Okay. Um, so there is a, uh, there is a point here. I'm actually, there we go. Yeah. If we could go to about 25 minutes. Yeah, that's good. If you ever tried asking questions to chat GPT for research. Pretty close. Yeah, do you understand this you problem know? with Palestinian leaders continuing to say, oh, oh. but then the guy left office. Oh, see, but this is, uh, this is what's interesting to me is that, you know, I've heard you say, I don't accept, uh, everyone else has their, has their, is, is really, really biased. You know, but I'm, I look at, I look at the facts and that, and that your analysis of the failures is entirely one-sided. Right, your analysis of the failures is the Palestinians walked away. The Palestinians turned to violence. All they do is fight, 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 fight. Right? This is a one-sided narrative. It's true. Right? The this inception a, of the Palestinian movement narrative. has been one of violence. The PLO started from guerrilla fighters. The PLO have been all about both, violence since their inception. Both parties here they are are violent parties. Yes, but only one has been forced to contend with political realities I mean, on the, the ground, I mean, and that's Israel. That's why Israel. I mean, you can say they're violent, but they form the, peace with partners that they thought they never would form peace with. Zionism is ultimately a movement based on conquest and dispossession. And Islam isn't? What's a caliphate? What was Islam. the Ottoman Empire? Islam, I don't, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not denying the violence of the Ottoman Empire. Why would I? Why would I? Why be? would we talk about the intrinsic uh, territorial conquest nature of Zionism when Zionists, Israel, have okay. given back uh, land uh, and territory to other part, countries, part, but then ignore it? it. There's no You're reason. Uh, this is. Maybe the most interesting example of random whataboutism I can remember watching in a political debate. It's like, look, I think about Nathan Robinson and the things that he's generally known to believe in and stand for. And I'm pretty sure that he's a devout Muslim who is um, very emotionally invested in defending the legacy of the Ottoman Empire. If you try to say the Ottomans were were violent around Nate at like a party, he's gonna go he's gonna go <laughs> ape shit and get so angry and start ranting and uh, kind of like a tanky, but for for, for, yeah, but for, for the Ottoman Empire for the Ottoman. No, and that that was you, you to your point, Nathan. It was like he's he he brings up these points so quickly, and then like one is like half good, but that was just really. Come on, I mean that's that's really silly, right? And I mean, really, if if they really were so violent, how could they make such a great chair? <laughs> yeah, that, that's about on par with some of the of, but, with the point that he made. But yeah, what were you saying? Well, no, I, I I will say one reason that he thinks that that sort of thing works is that there are there is a certain kind of leftist, and it is not the kind that any of us is. That uh, that that does you can fall into the binary. Uh, I need to defend the enemy of my enemy uh, type type thing. Um, it, it's what sort of leads a lot of people to uh, to wind up defending the Chinese Communist Party on things they shouldn't yeah. defend them on, right? And one of the great things that I, you know, learned early on from from Chomsky was you just go, oh no, both of those things are bad. I don't need to defend the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was also <laughs> was also bad. <laughs> yeah, I was I was uh, after the talk, the D Detroit DSA talk the other day. Somebody came up to me afterwards. And they were, you know, they they because they knew I'd written a book about about Christopher Hitchens, and you know, they were they were talking to me about Hitchens and the Iraq War, these arguments he used and stuff. And one of the things I told this person was like, I think you can get a lot of mileage in life out of the insight that more than one thing is allowed to be bad. Yeah. Right. You know, that like sometimes several things are bad all at the same time. Right. Uh, and yeah. is there a bit of like a race? Uh, did you feel like it was racist? Because to say that, you know, one Muslim is every Muslim or whatever word you want to use it. Like, I mean, you were talking about a very specific historical mm -hmm. example of the very same Zionists. I mean, the very same, you know, the there's a very clear lineage and history there of the very same people who are there now coming from people who violently dispossessed the people that were on the land while he was talking about like just random Muslims. It sounded like it didn't really, 
Like, yeah, I mean, and this also came up a lot of the debate because one thing that I noticed he repeated several times was in response to claims about uh, land being taken from from Palestinians, by by which I think you mostly meant like on a on a state level, right? Like this is like the this you know this state will be formed in this territory and then it's going to seize this you know this territory and all that stuff. Uh, he he repeatedly said, oh, but like the Arabs like sold, you know, sold early Zionists that land. So like what he's talking about are early, like basically the pre-1930s you know, kind of um, the early Yeshuv, which is what they called the, um, uh, the, the Zionist, you know, settlement before the, before the foundation of the state of Israel that um, the, the sort of land purchases which uh, one, I think is just not the same thing you were talking about, but two, it does go to the Ottoman point because like a lot of times uh, what you're actually talking about, there are people who were at best absentee landlords at worst had no clear connection at all uh, to, to this, who, who had these sort of old Ottoman era titles that, uh, that, that could be sold. I mean, this is the kind of thing you read like Rashid Khalidi, et cetera. He's, you know, he's always, uh, talking about and that these the, this was then used to like evict uh evict palestinians from from the land they were on and to to build these these ethnically uh exclusive you know settlements which um you know which 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 seems uh you know like 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 i think that there is i think there is this really significant conflation there right and and i think i, I also saw a uh, skelumph uh uh Yes, yeah, so I bet Nathan hasn't even condemned the Golden Horde yet. Uh, said earlier uh, that um, this is, you know, that there's also this thing that you see where, like, the the really good one is when people don't even talk about the Palestinians, as if this stateless population with no democratic mechanism for expressing its will uh, was all a hive mind. But they talk about the Arabs, right? The Arabs is even better because then everybody who's like in a country where Arabic is the language can, can be counted as part of a really big hive mind. And, and, and I noticed that a lot of destiny's sentences about the Palestinians, I mean, to, to be fair to him, he didn't use the phrase, the Arabs, but, um, but he would say things like, Oh, the Palestinians attacked in, you know, 1948 and 1967. And, you know, even putting aside, uh, that the who attacked who record uh, often doesn't line up with uh, with that. Well, what the there's a Palestinian army that attacked, you know, that Israel was fighting with in 1967. No, come on, it was fighting with like Egypt and Jordan, right? This is, uh, but you know, this is, uh, you know, it's it's hive minded on an even higher level because you know because you're 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 roping in uh, everybody, you know, in like not just this particular Arabic speaking ethnicity, but, you know, the, the entire region, you know, that's, uh, you know, that the, uh, that they're all part of like one big thing that can be blamed for anything that thing does. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I know, I know Nathan has to go soon. Uh, so, uh, let's go, uh, to, um, I think a, um, a pretty, uh, and pretty important, let's see. So if we go to about 40, uh, if we go to about 40 minutes in, right? Like, so, I'd, and, and I know the thing that I'm skipping here, although it is important, uh, and it's worth noting, yeah, even I if think we're not, we're we're not watching this part if everyone is, um, that there's a lot of discussion in this video about uh, the the right of return, right? This is, um, you know, this is something that uh, the destiny is 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 fairly fixated on uh, in in this debate, right? That like he that he because he sort of takes any time Palestinians or any time diplomatic representatives of other Arab countries talk about the right of return. Um, he sort of takes this as this kind of obviously absurd rejectionism that, uh, oh, see, people say they want peace, but really they're making this 
wild utopian demand that Israel isn't never going to you know recognize that Israel shouldn't recognize. I think I, I don't think that's being unfair to him uh, his position, but at the very least, he doesn't think they should have to. Um, and and the reason I'm bringing this up is because I I mean one. Um, I just think he's like very wrong about this. Uh, but two, I think it actually shows if you want to speak to this for a minute, that the position you're arguing for in this debate is actually a pretty moderate one, right? So you're not really making the case, you know, whether or not you would like endorse it in some sense, right? But you're not really making the case in this debate, uh, for like sweeping anti-Zionism uh, of of the you know um, you know of the sort that I pre- I for example think there's like an excellent case to be made for, but uh, you um, but yeah. your point I think is is very simple and it's very it's very U.S. focused, right? Yeah. That they have that's, that's true. yeah. So 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 like. Just because I don't want this to get lost, right? Before we before we watch any more, do you want to just kind of say, like, you know, what is it the thing that like you're arguing should happen, and like what's the mechanism by which it would happen? Yeah, I you know I I uh, I prepared for this debate because I I saw that he, you know, I saw a number of people sort of walk into a buzzsaw in debates with him and I didn't want that to be me. And one of the things that I didn't want to have happen was something I saw happen in a, a debate he had done previously where they'd gotten into, as you mentioned, a, a long discussion about, I think in the one I watched, it was uh, uh, about whether the number of settlements increased between 1996 and 1999. And I thought, this is really not where I want to go. Uh, what are the points that I really want to emphasize? And, and the point that I, I wanted to emphasize is that um, there first, you know, obviously since 1967, there has been an illegal occupation. Palestinians don't have the right to self-governance, right? They are denied the right to self-governance. They can't be citizens in a sovereign. Uh, they can't be citizens, full citizens of Israel, but they also don't have a state of their own. Um, that's a situation of plain injustice. You can call it apartheid, you can call it whatever. What needs to happen at the bare minimum is that Palestinians need to have that right of self-governance. Obviously, Israel has made it clear that they will never give Palestinians full civil rights within the state of Israel because uh, it would destroy their demographic majority, it would destroy the character of Israel as Jewish state, etc., Therefore, you are left only with the option that Palestinians deserve a state of their own. Why don't have pa- Palestinians have a state of their own? Well, one reason is that successive Israeli leaders, with the exception of a brief window uh, in 2000 and maybe 2008, um, uh, have consistently opposed the establishment of a Palestinian state. And also, the United States has been totally unwilling to put serious pressure on Israel to change that position and to agree to the establishment of a Palestinian state in accordance with the the basic conditions of, of, of justice. And I wanted to emphasize that, you know, the U.S., is the is the party that first off obviously Israel is our leading recipient of military aid, but we also support them diplomatically. Uh, we are the we are one of the only uh, countries that opposes the UN resolution passed every year or so that is the peaceful settlement of the Israel Palestine question that lays out the framework of the of a two of what the two states would be, uh, where they have to be. Um, obviously, there had to be some negotiations, but we are the ones who oppose the implementation of you know this deal, which has been worked out over and over. It's been worked out at the UN. It's been worked out at the um, the Geneva uh, summit. It's been worked out in the Arab Peace Initiative. We kind of know what it would look like to give Palestinians self determination, and U.S. leaders have not wanted to put any pressure on Israel to agree to it. And so, I wanted to emphasize over and over um, that. We have an immense responsibility in the United States to change that in order to get that basic 
criterion of justice, that is the granting of the Palestinian right to self-determination, um, to, to get that condition fulfilled. Yeah. Um, and and this is this is something that um, you know I, I mean and, and and again I mean I think this is really like uh, worth emphasizing how moderate this is because the the sort of thing that you know I mean I I think that uh, that Zionism is is just you know fundamentally uh you know wrong I, I don't think i don't think there should be should be ethno states uh of any kind right this um uh, and uh you know it doesn't matter to me what the ethnicity is uh i uh I, I don't think there should be states that are just for a given ethnic group and you know and and, and really what i would want right if and, and i'm don't get me wrong i'm under no illusion that this could happen just from like diplomatic pressure i mean what i'm describing is like a you know revolution but you know if, if, if it if it could somehow happen right what i'd really want is just for uh there to be a uh, a single you know democratic state with equal rights for everybody and writer you know and 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 anybody who'd been displaced from the country in the past you know or, or you know their you know children or grandchildren you know they can they can come uh come back and live there um but uh but but all you were doing in this debate is just argue it's like look let's assume that that's off the table so um let's just talk about the thing that is the official stated diplomatic position of like almost everybody almost everywhere including the united states officially right yes like this is what Joe Biden says he wants. This is what Thomas Friedman says he wants. They say they believe in the in the two state settlement. Yeah, and so I think the core of your point is just, hey, if you actually wanted that, you would, um, the United States, you know, which is currently arming and funding. Uh, Israel's uh, military as, as, as it, you know, besieges and, you know, and, and uh, mass murders and further displaces Palestinians um, and, you know, would, would stop doing that. Right. I mean, at the very goddamn least threatened to stop doing that as a, uh, as a form of leverage. Right. And, um, and, you know, stop, you know, the U S would stop providing Israel with diplomatic cover at the UN security council, et cetera. And, you know, and, and it would make a concerted effort, you know, because if there's one thing and sometimes people will say, oh, even if all this happened, you know, Israel would, would, would just stick to its guns. Maybe. Right. Um, although, you know, it's it's right now it's kind of unknowable, but, you know, maybe. But uh, but I think your point is, look, if you want there to be any chance of the thing that everybody says they want. Like not Netanyahu, right? He's pretty clear that he doesn't. But everybody else say they want, right? All of the other countries in the region say they want. Uh, the UN has said should happen a zillion times. Uh, even as you say, Joe Biden uh, and Thomas Friedman say that they want it. Well, if you want that thing to actually happen, and you know clearly Israel isn't just going to decide to grant it, because given the power relations on the ground, it's really hard to see how that would happen. Um, so if you want to change Israel's calculus to the point where they might grant it, then you'd want the U S to, uh, to apply every level of uh, pressure at its disposal, because that's the one thing that might do it. And that's something that, um, that's something that destiny was very resistant to, although it was very unclear to me why he kept saying things like, Oh, what you think the U S is responsible for everything our allies do. It's like, well, if the U S is providing the guns and the money and is constantly vetoing security resolutions, condemning it, then yeah, it, it does actually seem like the, uh, the, the U S is, is pretty responsible for that. Uh, but the other thing that I found really confusing about his position that I think comes out if, if we have time to watch one more clip is um, that he he sort of seems to want to to have it both ways, right? Because like you're saying, hey, I think if the U.S. exerted all this pressure, then Israel, you know, could go back to the table and and you know, 
and they would actually at that point, you know, maybe seal the deal on what they almost did at, in the past, you know, Taba, et cetera, right? Which is a two-state deal that at least maybe there's some land swaps, but it was at least roughly based on the 67 borders. And you'd probably have some sort of negotiated compromise on right of return where, uh, you know, Israel at least like officially acknowledged uh, the existence of this massive injustice and at least let in like a symbolic number of refugees to to do that. And Destiny's position seems to be, no, 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 no. Um, never going to happen. Actually, that, you know, a deal like that, like, I mean, one, he just never seemed to acknowledge uh, unless I missed it, that, you know, that, the, that some sort of like negotiated compromise on that last issue is, would, would even be possible. Right. But he, uh, but he just seems to think like, yeah, any, any even token acknowledgement of that is off the table. And, uh, and, and actually at this point, because there've been so many settlements built in the last few decades, uh, it would have to be a much more, you know, like you couldn't even have like anything that was roughly based on the 67 borders, and all I could think is, man, it really sounds like Destiny is making a case for a one-state solution. Yeah. Like, because if he's right about this, right, that you can't have like a two-state solution based on the sixty-seven borders, etc. It's like, well, look, one thing I hope we could agree that it's not okay to do, and this is like the sort of core point of principle that I think you rightly highlighted earlier. The one thing you can't do acceptably is rule over people without giving them rights the, with, with without giving well, them the vote. Yes, we would think there would be agreement on that, but he did seem to suggest, and I, I'm not quite clear on his position, so I don't want to misstate it, but he did seem to suggest when we were discussing the apartheid portion um, that I mean, he seemed to be giving a lot of justifications for denying Palestinians their their basic rights, right? So he would say, well, they're not citizens of Israel, even though they live within Israeli occupied territory. And I'd say, well, okay, well, then they should be citizens. And then he would sort of move to, okay, but Israel has legitimate security concerns that essentially trump the basic right to have to basic equal rights. Yeah, which is also amazing who gets to have legitimate security concerns and who doesn't, right? Like if you're a, uh, if you live in Gaza, uh, and, um, you know, your the apartment block in which you lived was destroyed. And yeah, I got some fucking to... security concerns. That, I mean, your personal security clearly counts for Bupkis in this, this calculation, right? Like it's, it's very, uh, you know, it's very confusing, right? This is like the right to de defend you, you know, Israel's right to defend itself, which I hear about all the time and have as long as I can remember having these arguments that uh, Israel has a right to defend itself, Israel has a right to defend itself. Okay, at some point, do some of its victims have a right to defend themselves? Like if, if, if you're a, um, you know, if, if you're a Palestinian in Gaza and like your entire family was murdered in airstrikes, like what sort of right to defend yourself do you have and what would it entail? And it, and, and it yeah. just... Seems Do you have to the right to blow up an Israeli tank if it's about to blow up your apartment building, right? Yeah. I think these are very uncomfortable questions for those who argue that Israel has a, a right to defend itself, right? If they're about to flatten your house, are you allowed to get? Do you have a right to kill Israeli soldiers? Um, they're about to flatten your house. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Uh, okay, I think uh, we, uh, so I know we did have time constraints and, and I have been keeping you for a while. So yeah. um, we, uh, we, will, we will probably cut off there and not watch what we're going to watch. But uh, I do just want to say, because I saw uh, Yuma1 in the chat, uh, asked just out of curiosity, is there a plan for you to debate Destiny directly on this or is it unlikely for various reasons? Look, I, uh, I, I have debated demand on other issues in the past uh t twice that i can remember um and and i'm certainly willing to do so again um i i have to say that that watching this debate to prepare for this episode i uh, i was really struck by um uh, i was really um struck by the the reminder of why i like the kinds of debates where there's uh 
there are time limits and it's very clear moderators and there's a moderator and all that stuff uh i think that there's a lot of stuff that went on in here that i think tends to go on in the absence of those things and so i would um i would rather you know do it with those things right so so um you know but but look um you know, if, if uh, Stephen watches this on, on a stream, which is the sort of thing that he does, um, and get to this point, yeah, I'd like a moderator. I'd like a pre-agreed time limit so it's not just yeah. that we're interrupting. I should have asked for those things. We're not just interrupting each other for, you know, two or three hours until it runs out of steam. But, <laughs> I uh, wish I'd asked for those things. <laughs> with, with all that in place, absolutely. Yes. I, I, am, I am very, very happy to, uh, to chat with him about these issues uh i think it would be interesting by the way this has been bothering me for the last few minutes does he have a rifle on the wall behind him what's going on with that he i believe i believe he does and it also looks like he has what i like to call hulk sexual lighting the uh, purple and green lights um i don't know I, that's probably not a thing I, I just made it up but uh uh to go with my bisexual lighting behind me yeah okay um yeah. I got uh, current affairs on the wall behind me. You know, yeah, I'm yeah, the same yeah. person. I don't have a, I'm not implicitly menacing people with a rifle all the time. Anyway. Yeah, no, it's it's just very very odd. And for some reason, I didn't really register it when I was watching it before. I was like, it's just whatever. It doesn't matter. I'm just um, I'm I'm just fascinated by that uh, decor choice. Um, but uh, but in any case, um, yeah, I will. Right. Uh, I would like it to, yeah, I'd like there to be a time limit. I'd like there to be a moderator and I would like uh, no, uh, no firearms uh, to, uh, to be involved. But if all of those conditions could be met, I am very happy to do that. Meanwhile, uh, this, uh, this was really interesting. Uh, and, and, and I really admire the uh, patience and fortitude shown in it. Well, so, uh, I learned from the best. Cause you know, we talked uh, we talked a couple of days before the thing and I was, uh, studying your technique because you're known as one of the only people who's done well uh in a debate with uh, this man and uh and i i realized that one of your techniques is, you know you're you're calm and you're patient and you stick to the points so i was uh, i was admiring the uh, the burgess method and uh, endeavored to deploy it You have been watching free public content from Give Them an Argument. To access every single episode of the show, the main show on uh, Monday nights, all of the streams, all of the uh, debate breakdowns, all of the patron exclusive post games on Monday nights, all of the patron exclusive bonus episodes every week, and much, much more, go to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. I cannot resist ending this with, don't be foolish. <laughs>